All right, so we're gonna do a presentation tonight called COVID-19 is the basics about how to keep yourself and your family safe. Um, my name is Dr. Valda Crowder and I'm an emergency medicine physician. Um, I've been an emergency medicine physician now for 30 years. Um, I also, um, through a company called Capital Health Partners, provide um, expert medical review for um, all the medical malpractice cases that come out of the Virgin Islands for their attorney general's office. I have my contact information down there and we're gonna to try to go through this um, and go, I'm gonna kind of go over what the basic structure is. Uh, the structure of the webinar is gonna be 20 to 25 minutes of a slide presentation, um, followed by 20 to 25 minutes of Q&A. Um, so all in all, we will be complete in about an hour or 45 minutes, depending upon the number of questions. Um, the presentation is essentially the same from week to week. However, I do put new information that, that pops up on here um, and as uh, information that, we, uh, that I get from medical journals, et cetera, um, I do update the presentation from week to week. Everyone will be muted. Um, you, will ask, um, you can ask questions at the end through your chat box. Um, if there are um, um, not too many people on the call, we may unmute people so that they can ask questions live. I'd love to see everybody live. All righty, so let's get started. So the purpose of this presentation is really for you to kind of think about what are the things that I actually, that you wanna to do to keep yourself safe and your family safe. I'm an emergency medicine physician. I've been an emergency medicine physician now for 30 years. Um, and I've treated patients across four pandemics, um, one mass shooting and one natural disaster. Um, so I'm gonna sort of share some things that um, I think would make a difference uh, during this particular time, um, given my experience with that and uh, some things that I think that you should think about with yourself and your family. The intention is to keep all the webinar participants in, informed with COVID-19 science, such that you can actually make informed decisions to keep your family healthy. The outcome is that you will leave the webinar motivated to create an action plan for you and your family, and that you then subsequently will be motivated to create an action plan for your broader community. So I'm gonna give people uh, one minute here to read the screen. This is a quote from the World Health Organization's Director General, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus. So what's great about this statement is that we actually all can do a lot to actually change the trajectory. We are not victims. We actually are empowered to actually make a difference in what the trajectory of this disease actually looks like. So what is a pandemic? A pandemic is a worldwide spread of a new disease, must be an infection, must be contagious, and something that people do not have immunity to. Examples, smallpox, polio, tuberculosis, HIV, bird flu, SARS, um, and MERS. One thing about uh, pandemics is they impact everyone, no matter what their social class is. So this is just a list here of sovereigns that were killed by smallpox. We're seeing that now with COVID-19, with Prince Charles in quarantine, Boris Johnson in the uh, intensive care unit. Um, so when a pandemic hits, there are people of all social, social strata who are impacted. What is COVID-19 and why is it called that? CO stands for Corona, which is Latin for crown or halo. And that's basically the way it looks in the slide to the right, um, where uh, when you look at the slide in a two-dimensional uh, view on a, under a microscope. VI stands for virus, D stands for disease, and 2019 is for 2019, which is when this strain first appeared. So that is how you get COVID-19. And that designation and that name was given to it by the World Health Organization. So what is important? Well, one thing is if you're over 65, you've probably experienced a pandemic or, or more than one in the past. Um, there's two final outcomes of any pandemic, a complete cure or near complete cure. So an example of that was smallpox was eradicated in 1980. Polio is near eradication. A near eradication, or some type of containment management with no vaccine or no cure. An example of that would be HIV. 
Now, how does coronavirus spread? Most people have sort of heard about this. It's people and small droplets and surfaces, right? So small droplets from the nose or mouth when people cough or exhale, um, or it can also be when people touch surfaces that have been impacted. So I tell people it's very important to respect COVID-19. One, is a droplet disease and it stays on surfaces for a long time. So porous surfaces, it can stay on 24 plus hours. Plastic or metal surfaces, it can stay on for 96 plus hours. It's highly, highly contagious. How is that calculated? That is calculated by the time of exposure. For COVID-19, it can be as little as 45 seconds and also percent penetration. So if 100 people get uh, exposed to COVID-19, 60 to 80 of them will actually catch the disease. When you look at something like influenza with exposure, only 20 or 30 will catch the disease. Now, let's talk about the difference between droplet and airborne because both droplet and airborne are technically in the air. A droplet is large, they, um, and it hits primarily the mucous membranes. Airborne is very small and can be actually inhaled. Droplets are less than five microns. Airborne is greater than five microns. Droplets will fall three feet from their place of origin. Airborne will remain in the air longer and can land further than five feet from, the dist from its uh, place of origin. So a droplet disease is Ebola, pertussis, mumps, COVID-19. Airborne disease is tuberculosis or measles. So this actually gives you a schematic of sort of what it looks like. And, and certainly the three feet and the six feet are not exact, but COVID-19 is gonna act more like an Ebola uh, than like a measles. Um, there is some evidence that COVID can go a little bit beyond the three feet and some of that science is still actually being investigated currently. So you have to really look at highly trafficked surfaces, doorknobs, handles, debit pin card, pin pads, gas station pumps, phones. It's very, very important for hospital workers to look at their shoes and scrubs. Um, it's important that they take off their shoes and take off their scrubs before coming into a main, uh, into a home. Um, we had a hospital worker in New York that actually infected um, and killed three of her own family members um, by um, her scrubs and shoes from the hospital. Now, let's talk about risk factors. Who actually gets a disease and doesn't do as well as others? So people born before 1955. So there's been a lot in the news about people being older or elderly. I actually like to use born on or before 1955. Um, because some people um, may be older and don't feel old. Maybe they run marathons, maybe they go to the gym. So, so the criteria really is born on or before 1955. Those living in a nursing home or long-term facility, those with chronic lung disease or uh, asthma, or those with heart disease. Um, we are um, we're also seeing uh, folks that are immunocompromised, either uh, with cancer, or they may have some HIV, or they may have an autoimmune disease. Um, they also are at um, increased, uh, increased risk to not do well with COVID-19. Um, the other risk factor that is not talked a, uh, talk a lot about in the news is anyone, with any, anyone of any age with severe obesity. And that is defined by the CDC as a bas body mass index or greater than 40. So any age, someone could be 20 or 25, it doesn't really matter. Um, that is a risk factor, and I'll go over what a BMI greater than 40 looks like. Then people who are pregnant should be monitored because they're known to have severe viral illnesses, but the CDC has not actually yet confirmed whether or not they are a, um, a risk factor. So what does a BMI over 40 look like? Someone 5'2", greater than 220 pounds, 5'6", greater than 250, 5'10", greater than 280, and six feet greater than 300 pounds. So this is one of the risk factors that is often um, not spoken about on the news. What also is a risk factor is that men are more likely to actually get COVID-19. And once they actually get COVID-19, they're more likely to do poorly. So um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, 
um, rather than having a 50-50 split, found that about 10, about 20% more men, so 58 to 42, um, got uh, COVID-19 compared to females. Um, when you actually look at death rate, men actually had about almost almost a 45, uh, almost a almost a 40, 45 percent higher risk of actually death um, from both uh, China and Italy uh, CDC. Clinical outcomes. If you have one risk factor, it increases the likelihood that you will actually be on a, in an ICU or on a respirator or die by 79 percent. If you have Two risk factors, it increases the likelihood of ICU respirator or dying by 250%. So this is something that we really do not wanna actually um, catch. This actually looks, and, uh, looks at death rates by specific disease, um, and it looks at uh, deaths per thousand people. And um, as you can see, as the number is higher, that means so cardiovascular disease in particular is a is a is a is a very um, very big risk factor where something like isolated hypertension is is less so. So let's talk about prevention matter, mat, measures. There's three different strategies: how to prevent getting it to begin with, how to prevent spreading it, and then what happens if I or my family member actually get COVID-19. So there's been a lot in the news about proper hand washing or washing your hands. I just wanted to actually show these eight slides because most people wash their hands and they do number one and maybe number two. But actually washing your hands properly includes number three, the back of your hand, number four, the base of your thumb, number five, the back of your fingers, number six, your fingernails, number seven, your, your wrists, and then rinsing and drying. The power of social distancing. This slide actually shows what happens with social distancing. So the first row, which is it says now, but it actually was before um, many of us had our stay at home orders, that one person in 30 days would wind up infecting 406 people. With 50% less exposure, one person would actually infect about 15 people in 30 days. And with 75% less exposure, which is kind of where we are now, then one person was still in, in fact about two and a half people in 30 days. So hand washing, social distancing, and what else can you do? So here are some of the guidelines that I have that I uh, recommend in addition to what the CDC recommends. So number one is do not go to the grocery store. Order your food and medication online. For the, elder, for the old elderly people who may not be on the computer, um, it'd be important if you have other family members that can call them and walk them through how to actually order groceries online. For those that don't wanna get on the computer, um, one family member can order them and have them sent to their address and either put a check in the mail or pay them later depending upon their relationship. When you have groceries or any sort of food delivered to your house, there should be no contact with the delivery person, not even a handoff. It is important that they actually just put the groceries or put the food on the ground. What I normally do after that is I then actually um, spray the groceries with Clorox and actually leave them there for a couple of hours if it's something that I can leave there. Then when I bring them into the home, I actually put them on the floor, not on the countertop, because the countertop is someplace that you touch a lot. Um, and then quickly remove any sort of um, cardboard, paper, plastic, and put into your own Tupperware containers. It is important to clean highly used surfaces frequently. And one of the things that is important with that to spray surfaces as opposed to wipe. If you actually look at the news, you'll see in other countries where they have people and men in white suits spraying. Spraying actually gives you more coverage of the surface area than wiping. Avoid using cash whenever possible and wipe down debit cards. Number four is very important. Do not get into small groups with your extended family for holidays or any sort of celebrations. Particularly with Easter coming up this weekend, it is very important that, that people don't say, well, you know, you were, you were kind of self-distancing, I was self-distancing, now let's get together. Um, that's actually when a lot of spread has occurred. And in China, we found that families were in clusters actually getting this disease and not doing well. Also, what's important um, for anyone with asthma or those caring, with as caring for those with asthma, 
do not use a nebulizer. A lot of people have at-home nebulizers. This turns a droplet into an aerosolized disease. So when someone is having an asthma attack, you do not know if that's COVID-19 or their regular asthma attack because it looks the same. So instead, use an inhaler with an aero chamber or spacer, and the picture of it is right here to the right. And basically, you put two puffs in there and then breathe in and out. This aero chamber or spacer actually delivers just as much uh, medication into the lungs um, as a nebulizer machine. If you feel like you must use a nebulizer machine, you can always use it outdoors. Facial hair. Um, there's a lot of conversation around facial hair, specifically, um, one, it is a place where the COVID virus can actually to surface, that the, that the COVID virus can actually stay on and accumulate. Um, also, you're, you know, a lot of times the masks don't fit as well if someone has facial hair. I would actually just advise to get rid of it for right now until this is actually over. To wear a mask or not wear a mask. When we started this presentation, there was still a debate about that. The CDC has since come out. Uh, my recommendation has always been to wear a mask. And people, women who are pregnant or near delivery. I think this is very important. Um, for a healthy pregnancy, you really want to consider actually having a home delivery with a midwife. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot of COVID infection in the hospital um, and you don't, I wouldn't really risk um, actually being exposed to that if I felt like I didn't have to. Missing your personal care services. I am too. <laughs> I suggest do not go to anyone's home to get your hair done or your nails done and do not allow anyone to come to your home to do your nails or hair. Um, I've had to struggle, as you'll see when we go to video, and my hair looks different than it normally looks, but it's just simply not worth it. Action plan. So what if you think you have COVID-19? What are the symptoms? So one, you can have COVID-19 and have no symptoms and be completely asymptomatic. In the study in Iceland, where they actually tested the highest per capita number of patients, um, what they found was that 50% of their COVID-positive tests were from asymptomatic people. So you can have no symptoms and you can be completely fine and have COVID-19. There's also sudden loss of taste or smell for some people. Some people have GI symptoms. They have some nausea, some vomiting and diarrhea. Then there are the symptoms that you hear about on the news, which is the headache, the fever, the achiness, the dry cough, the difficulty breathing. But I made this slide because I, I specifically wanted people to realize that just because you don't have a dry cough and fever and achiness, it doesn't mean you don't have it. There are many, many other symptoms of COVID-19 that are not being talked about on television. What to do if you think you have COVID-19? There's been a debate about Tylenol versus ibuprofen. Um, the World Health Organization originally um, recommended avoiding ibuprofen. Um, they thought that it made the disease worse, the progression of the disease worse. Um, they walked that advice back. I personally, if I got sick, I would take Tylenol and not ibuprofen or Aleve. Um, do not go to the hospital unless you're really, 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 really sick. Um, aggressive testing guidelines vary by state, state by state. So a lot of people have asked me a lot of questions about testing. And it's very difficult to actually answer those questions because every state is doing things differently and every state is changing how they're doing it and we don't have a federally um, coordinated testing system. Social distancing versus self-quarantining. I wanna kind of go over this because there's been some confusion about this. So social distancing is for everyone. Self-quarantine is for COVID positive patients or patients with the symptoms whether or not it's respiratory or GI, it doesn't matter, and have not been tested. So social distancing is staying six feet away from others. Self-quarantine is complete isolation, actually staying in a room, someone drops off your food to you at the room, and you know, preferably there's a bathroom in the room, and you literally do not come out for 14 days. So social distancing is for now. Self-quarantine is for 14 days minimum. Um, in Italy, they found that some people were still positive after 14 days. If you can tolerate it, I tell people to do 21 days. 
Um, now, obviously, if you get a test during that time period and you're found to be COVID negative, then you can actually just go back to social distancing. Now, some people have said, well, why don't I just catch it and I can get immunity? Well, that's not really a great idea. One is that the immunity with COVID-19 is not necessarily a lifetime immunity. It looks like it's some period of time. Secondly, COVID-19 sits in the lungs and it actually causes a pulmonary fibrosis and a pulmonary scarring. Um, it, the viral pneumonia that occurs with COVID-19 has a 50% death rate. Those people who survive, 30 or 40% of them actually have decreased lung capacity and have problems with breathing afterwards. So it's not really a good idea to actually get to take to, to um, it's not a good idea to actually um, uh, get the disease just to get immunity. Um, additionally, uh, some people have, um, because they're young and they thought that they weren't going to necessarily um, get the disease um, or get it that bad. I remind people that in DC, uh, people less than 40 years old are, make up 50% of the hospitalizations. How to win against COVID-19? Early detection and early response. Early detection and early, I'm sorry about my dog, sorry about that, but early detection and early response are really, really all what we need. Universal precautions. Universal precautions are as follows. I assume I have the disease. I assume you have the disease. You assume you have it, and you assume I have it. Um, importance of testing. Again, asymptomatic people can spread the disease. This uh, just shows why Italy, Italy, they were not able to actually get rid of it until they actually started testing everyone. Now, there are some people who've called me because they their family member has already gotten COVID-19 and they're in the ICU. I put my information there um, on my Twitter account and on the, on the web page. I actually have this. This is the um, Duke University um, uh, experimental protocol treatment options for um, COVID-19. I know there's been a lot of talk about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, but there's other medications. The antivirals there, libinavir or ritonavir, um, and so there's there's this is what it actually looks like. Um, the other thing is that when someone is uh, ventilated with COVID-19, they do better if you lay them on their stomach. So many people in the ICU are on their back. Um, so uh, this stuff, I'm actually we're beginning to load some of this stuff up to the website, so people will have some place to go. Forward thinking action steps. One, consider now what would happen if you had to be quarantined in your home. Where would you actually go? What, what, what room would you actually use? How would you actually, how would you actually get the things that you need? Um, do you have the over-the-counter medications that you need if you actually get sick? One thing about this particular disease is it moves very fast. Um, and people are well and then suddenly they're extremely ill. What mask or mask alternatives do I have? Um, some people are, are sewing masks. Um, if you sew a mask, then usually like something that's three-ply cotton seems to, be, seems to work the best. How am I going to limit my exposure to highly trafficked surfaces? Um, what am I going to wear gloves? What, what exactly am I going to do? The other thing that is important, if you're a company or a union, you need an occupational health plan to actually deal with this particular disease. If you're a state or local government, it is very important to engage a multidisciplinary group of community leaders, medical professionals, and elected officials so that you can actually use science as well as community outreach to actually deal with staffing shortages, PPE strategies, and also healthcare, ac healthcare access problems. Um, this is just an example with the, from a union perspective where there's 100 American airline uh, employee, flight attendants um, that uh, have coronavirus uh, per their uh, union. What's next? Social distancing until we've turned the corner. Um, if, you're, if your employment is significantly impacted by this, you may want to look at what you can do remotely. A vaccine is 12 to 18 months away, and that would actually be quick. Um, I'm asking people to stay alert and informed with government alerts, CDC, and the World Health Organization and to respect COVID-19 and create a plan for yourself, your family, and your community. 
We've set up some ways for um, to communicate on Twitter. We've been uploading articles on the Twitter account, which is here. The website is here and actually has um, the website is here and actually has all of the um, uh, all of the articles and the, and um, and the various uh, topics. Um, and I will now um, switch it over to uh, question and answer. Uh, if you were self quarantined for symptoms and then tested negative um, and are distancing in a house with other people, what do we have to do to sanitize? Yeah, so if you actually had symptoms of feeling sick and then you actually had a negative test, that means you just had some, some regular old viral illness that was not COVID-19. So you could clean the way you actually would normally, would normally clean. So um, you don't really have to take any sort of extra precautions around, um, around cleaning um, because of your illness. Um, I'd clean a little extra because we're in a pandemic, but I wouldn't necessarily clean anymore because once you're negative, that actually shows that you're probably just had a regular viral illness. Um, so, okay, and next question. Um, what should you have in a quarantine room? Yeah, so a couple of things you should have in a quarantine room is one, you wanna make sure to have your over-the-counter medications um, for things like the Tylenol or any sort of uh, you know, common cough and cold medications. Um, the other thing you wanna have in a quarantine room is books to read, a TV, you know, as, much as, as much as you can put in that room for, your, for yourself to do. Um, uh, if the bathroom can be in there, that would be great. Um, the, uh, the other things that I think would be important, oh, it's very important that you have a phone. So it's very, very important that you have a phone in the quarantine room because um, if you start to feel worse, you need to be able to call someone. Um, so those, those would be the most important things. Okay, in the Q&A box we have, uh, they are saying 14 days to self-quarantine if you suspect you've come in contact with one who is confirmed or you possibly have it. You mentioned a 20-day suggestion. Why? Yeah, so in Italy, when they did the 14-day quarantine, and, I'm, and I apologize, my, my dog gets a little restless here near the, near the end. <laughs> so I apologize. Hold on just a second. So in the... Um, when they actually when they actually did when they actually did this in Italy, what they found was that after 14 days, they still had um, they still had people testing positive. So they had to re-quarantine them for another seven days. And after they re-quarantined them for another seven days, um, then they actually that is that is what it took before they got everyone negative that was positive. So we're assuming that 14 days is enough. Italy actually tested people after the 14 days. Understood. Okay, next question. Um, a, a, few, a few of the states are now doing, doing rapid testing. Can, that, can we trust them? Yes. Yeah, so um, now we haven't seen the false positive and false negative um, test results from the rapid or or the long-term test so I don't we don't have any data right now on which one is actually better um, but everything that I've actually read suggests that the one thing about the rapid test that is actually better is that you know right away you don't have to quarantine so when the test takes a long time to come back then you're literally quarantining until it comes back so I would do a, I would do a, a rapid test. We don't have any information that one test is any better than the other at this point in time. What, what's the difference between the rapid test and the longer test times and the blood test? Um, and can we feel confident with, you've already answered the confidence question, but what's the difference between them? And is there any data to suggest anything about false negatives? Yeah, so I haven't seen any data yet on um, on false on false negatives or false positives um, that um, has been really uh, definitive. I haven't seen anything about that. I think that's just because we haven't done a lot of a lot of uh, testing. 
but the blood test is actually to see if you were actually exposed to it. So the blood test is very different. The blood test is, do you have antibody to COVID-19, which means you've been exposed to it and you've developed some type of immunity. And then um, there are experimental protocols where they're actually taking the plasma from someone who's actually been exposed to it and has the antibodies and giving it to the, the patients that are in the intensive care unit. And that is actually working very well. Um, so I hope that kind of answers the question. Okay. Yep. And um, you can continue to put questions in either the Q&A or the chat. We'll just keep rolling through. Um, next question. I have a lot of friends living with roommates who have to leave and come back for their work. I know you mentioned regular cleaning. What other things can we do or share with friends to help? Yeah, so, um, you know, people who are sort of going in and out and still working. So one of the things is that um, we keep a um, bottle of uh, Clorox at the door and spray the bottom of our shoes and take our shoes off. Mm -hmm. um, my goddaughter, who also works at a hospital, um, I have her actually shower downstairs before coming up take your clothes completely off and shower downstairs and leave them down there in the, in the, in the, in the basement where there's like a washing, washing machine area. Um, so I would say, you know, when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with roommates, um, it's, it's, it's really, I would really focus on the, on the countertops, doorknobs, and also the, um, uh, the shoes, the shoes coming in. Next question. Um, so I've seen the latest possible treatment is to use the plasma from a recovered COVID-19 person. Does the person have to have the same blood type? Yes. Yes, they do. So when you get any sort of blood products, they're gonna match that blood type just like they do with, with, when they give you packed red blood cells or platelets or anything else. Okay. Uh, next question, what's a way that we can help doctors? Ah, <laughs> well, I would say, um, you know, I would say, you know, if you, um, I would say the main thing is, um, you know, one, uh, if you, uh, if you run into them, uh, tell them, uh, tell them you appreciate their hard work. Um, also, too, I would also say that, you know, uh, if you do wind up going into any sort of healthcare facility and you see anybody in there that is not properly gowned and gloved up, I would actually complain to administration. Um, I think it's important that um, it's not only just our safety, but, it's, but sometimes administration of hospitals, they react more when they feel like it's a customer complaint then when they, they value a customer complaint basically more than they value our safety necessarily. So, um, so um, and um, yeah, I would just say, you know, um, um, you know, when you, when you, when you meet the professionals or, or you interface with them, just let them know that you appreciate what they, you know, what they've done. This will be over. I've said that, you know, I would like for us as all of the essential workers, including the grocery and the cleaning folks, and the uh, um, medical physicians, all the transit people, I think there should be a ticker tape parade. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, especially the transport people, transporting Ooh, all the goods yes. in there. Um, oh, yeah. I'm really feeling them right now. Um, okay, so another question we have, a couple of more questions. Um, you discussed uh, the suggestion of wiping down groceries. Uh, how should we deal with produce? Yeah, so um, produce really needs to be washed with like soap and water. So one thing about this particular virus, it has a, um, a, a fat soluble cover. So soap and water actually um, uh, really destroy it quickly. So I would wash down all vegetables with soap and water and make sure that the water is slightly warm. Um, this is a follow-up question that I have. I've been using that um, vegetable wash. Is that effective? I don't know what's in it. Uh, if if it's a if it's a soapy if it's something that's soapy, or the way you could find out is drop drop some oil in it and see what it does to some oil. If it kind of separates an oil, then it would be something that you could actually um, that you could use that you could use for that. 
Okay. Next question. I work for a government entity and they told a detention officer um, they could not wear a mask in the facility while policing the inmates. Is that feasible and should masks be distributed to the inmates? Yeah, so the, you know, the issue with the, in the correctional facility is really, really um, significant. Um, I believe that, I believe that you, sh so I've already seen uh, in one weekend, I think I saw about three correctional officers that were exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19 positive in a very rural area of Virginia. Um, I, and this is why I think some of the unions are so important. I don't know if you're in a unionized work setting, um, but uh, I do think you should be wearing um, a mask in a correctional setting. Um, I have worked in a correctional setting before, and if I was there now, I would be wearing a mask all the time. Um, and, um, you know, I would say that, you know, if you're in a unionized setting, actually really um, complain to your union rep. Um, and you know there there is there is there there is a rub here where people really have to look at you know is my if my job is not adequately allowing me to protect myself do I still want to work at it? Mm -hmm. Which is a very difficult and personal decision. Okay, I'm gonna skip around a little bit. I heard microwaving food for thirty seconds will kill any virus on it. Is that true? Yeah, I don't know that that's true. I know that this I know that this virus is particularly sensitive to UV uh, waves, um, but I don't know. Uh, people have asked the microwaving question, and I'm just and I'm not sure. Okay. Um, my hands are so dry from washing. Is it okay to use lotion? Yes, I would use lotion. I actually use um, A and D ointment or some of the baby ointment that you use on the you know on, on the babies when their butts get all dry, and that's what I've actually been using. But yeah, you can use lotion and any sort of ointment or oil afterwards. It, your hands do get very dry. All right, we'll see if we have any other questions in the queue. All right. I don't see any additional questions at this point. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. And, um, you know, feel free to join us on Thursday and feel free to invite anybody in your family that you think might not be taking this seriously <laughs> or needs to really take a look at the information so that they can actually really start protecting themselves.